All right, do you guys hear this? That's what good f sounds like. I love how the one day I decide to film is the day where my neighbors decide to blast music outside the neighborhood. So apologies for the noise. I probably shouldn't be filming today and just wait for a quieter day. But I'm really hungry and I'm gonna cook and I wanna take advantage of this opportunity of myself cooking to film it. For your entertainment, if I mess up, which I always do. So today we're gonna make Epic Nacho Mac and Cheese. They are not sponsoring me for this video. You know who is sponsoring? NordVPN. I've been using them for over two years now. And I love it because I want to make sure my internet activity is anonymous. I don't want people to track my data. They have super fast servers. There's over 5,560 countries. You can use it to unlock Netflix and your other favorite entertainment websites. Personally, I use it for when I'm checking out a show that isn't available in the US. I can just change my IP address and pretend like I'm in a different country so that I can get access to those shows. But it also helps when I'm traveling and when I'm in public. So a lot of times when you're in like coffee shops or airports, it's very easy for your data to be vulnerable. You can get up to six simultaneous connections. There's 24 seven customer support. And if you don't like it for whatever reason, there is a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you are interested, you can get a really great deal in my description box below. All you have to do is go to nordvpn.com slash readwithcindy and use my code readwithcindy. Now, let's get cooking. So while you see me struggle to make this mac and cheese, while you have the lovely ambiance of New York in the background, let me tell you about the books I read in the month of June. First, I'll start off with some graphic novels that I read. I normally don't read graphic novels, but my partner is a huge fan of them. So when she was visiting me, we read a couple of them together, starting with the first two volumes of Heartstopper. She loves the graphic novel. She has all of the volumes. I am brand new to it. But I really loved the show and I was curious about how the graphic novels were like. It follows a British boy who is gay at his school. He's very shy, very high strung and anxious like many of you gays are. So I guess that is accurate representation, isn't it? Yeah, I'm calling you out. All the gays are watching this video. If you spend your free time watching some Asian lady cook for fun, you definitely have anxiety issues. The story starts when he gets assigned to sit next to a jock kind of character. Part of the beginning of this whole series is the main character falling for his classmate and that classmate, as they become friends and closer together, also realizing that he may not be straight after all. I can definitely see why a lot of people would enjoy it and feel represented by it because it's nice to have just like a pure, sweet, wholesome kind of story about gay teens. For me, I'm not quite quite sure if I'm the target demographic, but I think that's how I've always been when it comes to media that depicts gay boys or gay men. Those stories target either other gay men or women who eat that shit up. And I was just never a woman who ate that shit up. Thank God though, because I don't want to be one of those people who fetishize those kinds of relationships like a lot of other booktubers. <clears throat> the appeal to me when it came to Netflix show was how you could really see that this was an authentic portrayal of gay teens because they actually cast accurately to gay teenagers. And the show expanded to be more than just Nick and Charlie's story. They showed the other side characters and really brought them to life, including giving the lesbian side characters their own stories and their own screen time. And I was a little disappointed to read the graphic novels and see that the girls were not there at all. It was literally just Nick and Charlie. There was this more universal quality to it in the show. One of the best scenes in the show was a scene that I found out they added. And it was a scene where the guys were at this party and the jaw character was still confused about how he felt for the main character. And then there's this beautiful dance scene. He sees these girls kiss. It's just this huge happy celebration where they're happy together and dancing together. And he smiles in fucking lesbian solidarity. And he realizes that he could be happy like that too. And I loved how that really just 
connected LGBT all together. And so in contrast, reading the graphic novels felt a little bit more limited. All right, you're not gonna see this, but my pot is boiling, just like how the fangirls for Heartstopper are probably boiling from my disappointment with the graphic novels. But I'm gonna go ahead and, oh God, the police are coming. The fangirls have alerted my review about this book. Well, I'm still gonna try to boil my pasta before the police come get me. When I read the books, I felt like it was very obvious that this was not written by a gay man. That was really distracting for me. And I feel like it wasn't obvious when it came to the show because they were actually played by gay men. And the story was about more than just young gay boys. Whereas the novel, because it's so limited to just this story and wasn't written by a gay boy, I felt like it was very obvious to me in the way that the romance and the characters and dialogue are depicted. It's kind of like when you read these types of stories and one of the gay boys is depicted as like much more feminine and he's kind of like a wooby character very soft and be like ooh woo, like oh, you like me even though I'm so soft and small like he literally says that to the jaw character where he's like but I'm weak and skinny like that's a literal line that he says and I'm just like uh. the girlies who get it get it if you're familiar with how a lot of mainstream gay media is hugely written by people who are not gay men then it's depicted differently in a way that I've heard from other people is not authentic and yet it gets way more popularity and I feel like knowing that fact kind of bothers me a little bit and that's what distracts me from like fully embracing the story. Is it harmful representation? I don't think so. Like I didn't read this book and think, oh my God, this is so wrong and off base. It was just distracting for me. However, I appreciate that it still provided representation that a lot of gay teenagers needed and enjoyed and that it ultimately opened avenues for this amazing Netflix adaptation that ended up giving those roles to actual gay boys. So in conclusion, I think I'm gonna stick to the Netflix show. Moving on to the next graphic novel before y'all kill me. The next one that I read is Apricorn Cove. This is about a young girl with the cutest hair. I want that hair color. Just a cute little peachy pink hair. So wonderful that she got that going on for her even though her mommy is dead. But her dad was like, yo, let's bring up that old trauma again by visiting our old seaside town where your mother used to live and you have all these happy memories of a mother that is no more. You know, very main character energy compared to real life where you need therapy. In this graphic novel, instead, you stumble across this colony of aquacorns, which are these magical sea creatures. They kind of look like seahorses. She ends up saving one of them and tries to nurse them back to health. And the whole time, she is also exploring this town, which is not doing so well. And it kind of provides this conversation about what people can do to still provide for themselves, but also not fuck up the ocean. The adult that she stays with is one of those fishermen. She gives very butch energy and I loved that. And you find out that a long time ago she used to have a friendship with this hot sapphic woman from this undersea palace. But they had a disagreement a long time ago because she was fucking up the ocean. But she was like, I have to do that though because my village is very poor and we need to eat. So I gotta do what I gotta do. The hot sapphic lady was like, man, you don't understand. Like if you fuck it up for us, you fuck it up for yourselves too. And they broke up. The main girl is learning about all this. And the story is basically about her finding the courage to stand up to these adults and try to reason with them and communicate with them that it's important to protect the ocean and have more of a symbiotic relationship with them. It's basically just like a simple, sweet story that would be good for middle grade kids. I kind of would have liked it to be maybe like 100 pages longer because then you could get more character development and plot development. But instead, we're gonna go with short and sweet. Not very subtle messaging, but it's okay given the target audience. I was pleasantly surprised by the casual sapphic relationship. I too would like to be rescued by a hot mermaid that takes me to her underground palace. Speaking of sapphic relationships, the next book that I read is Yerba Buena. This follows two girls. One of them is from a town that has a drug problem and as a result of the drug problem she actually ends up losing her girlfriend because she's so overcome by grief and also just with the fact that she lives in such like a shitty town and doesn't have the best family situation. She 
she decides to run away and start over with a new life in LA. The other main character we follow takes a job arranging flowers for this bougie LA restaurant and ends up having an affair with the restaurant owner because she doesn't really have an identity of her own and she's kind of lost. I think around the halfway point of the story, you finally see the two characters meet. They form this relationship together, but then obviously they have the baggage from their past. It's basically sad girl summer vibes with a splash of sapphic because this is Nina LaCour we're talking about. I've read two books by her already and I've enjoyed both of them. And I was really into it in the beginning. Like I felt like this was just the right amount of sadness for me, which is what Nina also tends to do well. She gives enough sadness for me to ruminate on it, but not too much that I'm fucking depressed. However, as I read more of the book, I became less engaged with it. And let me tell you the tea for why after I move you around, because my pasta is ready. So I've been boiling it and it looks pretty done to me. We're gonna toss this into the frying pan. Oh shit. I don't have butter, and apparently you're supposed to add that. I'm gonna try to substitute with oil instead and hope for the best. The reason why I did not like Yerba Buena as much as I wanted to was because as I kept on reading, I realized that the story is actually pretty disjointed. I think this is more obvious when you finally see the characters meet. <laughs> Oh god, oh, not the sapphics coming from my throat with this lukewarm review. <sighs> I'm sorry y'all, I know it was Pride Month, but I guess I'm homophobic after all. Oh shit, I hope I didn't stick my pan. This is not going well for me by the way. So when they finally meet, there was like no time or room for them to like have any kind of development or feelings for each other. They saw each other and then they were immediately attracted and then they got together. Like I'm sure that happens in real life, but in terms of a narrative, it was just so insta-lovey. And because of that, it kind of takes away from like the emotional stakes that we could have had for the story. Like you spent all this time building building up their background stories and their trauma. And then it's like, boom, they see each other and they're in love and it's true love and it's deeper than any other relationship they've ever had. Why though? We don't have any inclination of that. And now I'm just seeing two disjointed stories that are awkwardly forced together. Maybe it would have been more effective if she had just focused on one character and we follow her story instead because now we're just following two characters and I don't understand why we're doing that and like why they have to be connected especially when their relationship isn't giving me anything. Just added water and now looks like doo-doo water. Things are going really well. So unfortunately I'm gonna have to give my girl Nina three stars for this one but it's okay because as you can clearly tell I'm a fucking idiot so my opinion means nothing. You know that's what I don't get. Why do authors and even other readers get so pressed when I have a different opinion that is not super favorable of a book. Can't you tell by my videos I'm a fucking idiot? No one should feel threatened by my opinions because I clearly don't know shit. And moving on before I spiral. By the way, I'm adding cream cheese. Hopefully that will make the whatever this is more delectable. Next book that I read is Book Lovers. This is a romance book that is a subversion of the Hallmark movies that you typically see where there is a cold career woman or man because men can have careers too. That's called equality. They go to a small town. They end up falling in love with someone from the rural countryside who makes them change their ways and they decide to leave their city job and live happily ever after. And usually the businessman or woman already has a significant other in the city, but they obviously fall for the charming small town person and leave the other city bitch instead. And the main character is the bitch that always gets left. She is also a book agent and typically works with writers who craft these kinds of stories. So it gets very meta. Oh my god, this is actually very gross. Hold on. So it turns out that adding cream cheese cannot salvage whatever poopy sauce I'm making. The story begins when her sister wants to take a vacation with just the two of them to a small town. Very typical Hallmark movie adventure that is being set up here, except instead of the main character meeting some rugged 
rugged lumberjack that changes her ways. The love interest here is actually another person in her industry. He's a book editor and he's very similar to her. Is very career oriented, very practical and pragmatic. He is also there too for a trip and it turns out that this is his hometown. He left there to move to the city in New York and obviously this isn't his kind of thing. He's just there to help his family out. Okay, I don't know if I'm just telling myself that this looks decent now, but I kind of think it does. I don't know. We're putting together like the cheese and the foundation so that we can mix it with the pasta later. I think when you see a very common cliche storyline, it's actually pretty easy to subvert it and then just be done with it. But I really like the author's decisions for what to subvert. In particular, the way that the main character is depicted as a career oriented woman who likes the city and likes to be a type A kind of personality. The story never shames her for being that way or depicts it as a bad thing. There's no pressure for her to change her ways or even her personality because those are the things that make her a great person. She cares about her job, which means that she defends her clients and loves her stories and is passionate about something. And she may be kind of a control freak, but it also makes her a dependable person to other people in her life. The love interest doesn't try to change her, but is actually there to show that she's fine just the way that she is. Being a character who doesn't want children, wants to stay in New York permanently, wants to prioritize her career, those are things that are still kept intact. But what I'm most impressed by is the way that the book handled third act conflicts. This is an issue that I always have whenever I read a romance book because typically whenever you get to the third act, there is some misunderstanding so that their relationship gets threatened. What I really enjoyed without spoiling what happens is that not only was the third act conflict not about a misunderstanding, I also liked that there were multiple third act conflicts. That really surprised me because it's always just like one conflict, like everything's going well, right? And then one stupid conflict happens and you're like, all right, let's get this shit over with. And then they do and then it's a happy ending. Not only was the first conflict kind of juicy because I was like, oh shit. Like, I get why this would happen. But then, Emily Henry followed it up with a second conflict, and then a third conflict, and I was like, oh shit. And none of these conflicts felt like they were forced or thrown in there for the sake of having a third act conflict. It felt like very real issues that could happen to someone who is like the main character, a career woman. And there was a quote that I really liked in the book where it said, there is no happy ending for a woman who wants it all. And I feel like that resonated with me because that is the struggle that a lot of career women face where it's hard to like balance a family or balance other things while prioritizing your career. And it's almost like you have to sacrifice a lot of things, but you don't actually have everything. You can only have one thing. And that's so limited because it's like, is that truly a perfect happy ending? And therefore it felt more realistic because that's how life is. You don't just get one misunderstanding and you get it over with. There can be multiple barriers that are in the way for you to truly achieve what you want. I don't know if it's because I have low standards when it comes to romance books, but I was like, good for you, Emily Henry. You could argue that the love interest isn't really developed that well because the story ends up being more than just the romance. Like it also focused on the main character's interpersonal relationships, like with her family and her own personal issues. But I kind of like that. I think it rounds it out a lot better instead of just solely focusing on romance. So I'm willing to forgive like a little bit of the nitpicky stuff and just go ahead and round it up to five stars. Now the question is, will you forgive whatever the fuck this is that I just made? She a little thick? I don't even know. It's supposed to be a little thick? We're gonna find out. We're gonna put the pasta in it. The next book that I read is Gallant. I don't know if I would call it like a dark fantasy. Forgive me for using my hands, but the pasta is stuck to the bowl. I wash my hands. Also, I'm gonna be the only one eating it anyway. It's about this girl who leaves a school that typically takes an orphan girl. And the whole time that she was in school, she was struggling a lot because she is mute. A lot of the girls tend to pick on her for that. The only 
only thing she really knows about her childhood and her family is this journal that her mother kept. The journal starts off kind of normal, but then the mom writes a lot of like cryptic shit, and it is assumed that the mom just descended into madness. And the story begins when she receives a letter from her uncle. She is invited to this manor that the family lives in called Gallant. But the weird part is in the mom's journal, she had previously lived in the Gallant Manor and in the letters that the mom wrote to her daughter, she says to never ever ever go to Gallant. So the main girl is like, hmm, that's weird, that's suspicious, but I don't have any other family and all these other girls are bitches. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to Gallant anyway because if anything, we'll have spooky vibes and spooky atmosphere and that's what B.E. Schwab is all about. This house seems to have secrets, she doesn't know why, then she uncovers this ruined wall. She sees it outside and she crosses over the place and then she sees like the same manner except it's not. It's like this weird upside down version of it. If you've watched season four of Stranger Things, you know what I mean? Where like you go to this weird upside down version of a house but it's like crumbling and like something's not quite right about it. So the story is basically about her uncovering the secrets about what's going on with this house, what's going on with her family, why did her mom allegedly go crazy. I was so ready to rate this four stars because I was all about the vibes. Unfortunately, I guess having a good story actually does matter after all, even if the writing is good. And the story I felt like was lacking, just like how this pasta is lacking butter. But you know, in solidarity with BTS on hiatus, I will not be using butter. All right, do you guys hear this? That's what good pussy sounds like. The reason why the story wasn't hitting was because I kind of felt like this was more of half an idea that the author had in her back pocket. And she was like, oh, it's time for me to publish something. Let me just take one of the ideas I had already in the back of my mind. Again, sorry for using my hands. I clean them, okay? All right, this is for the purpose out there watching this. Mm-mm-mm. Love my doo-doo mac and cheese. The reason why I don't feel like it was a fully formed idea was because the characters were very surface level. I think the main character is obviously the most developed because you're in her head a lot. But the other characters, like, what are they? The plot is extremely self-contained, which I don't necessarily mind. But it kind of felt like it was contained to the point where there wasn't much else. Like, it's literally about a house and how spooky it is. But like, uh, there's, that's not enough, you know? I'm gonna need more than just atmosphere. It really did feel like it was just an idea that she had, but didn't really give the time to fully develop and marinate. And then as I kept on reading and examining the writing, I also got that same impression from the writing. Like it kind of felt like she wrote this quickly because a lot of it just felt like we were going off of vibes rather than being more purposeful with developing the plot and characters more. But I definitely got the impression that this book wasn't really a high priority for her or a passion for her compared to the other books that I've read from her. Like when I read The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, I didn't care for the story, but I could tell that V.E. Schwab was putting her Schwab bussy into that story because of the writing. I could tell she was working on that shit for a long time. Whereas this one kind of felt like she just sat and then just won and done it. Maybe that's just me being over analytical though because I've been stuck writing my own novel. So I can kind of see when people bullshit because it takes a bullshitter to no one. All right, let's wrap this shit up with the last book that I read for the month. It is called The Moonlight Child. It features the protagonist as an older woman. So this one night she goes outside to her backyard because she wants to see the lunar eclipse. But then when she's there, she notices from the window that there is this little girl who's washing the dishes. And this is really weird to her because she knows that this family doesn't have a daughter. As far as she knows, it's just a mother, a father, and their teenage son. But she's never seen this girl before, and yet this girl lives in this house. So she could have let something like this go, but then the story begins when her daughter, who is a social worker, asks her to take in this 18 year old girl 
who was a former foster child. This girl lives with her, but then she also tells the main character that she is seeing the same girl, like the same little girl in the family's house, even though they don't have a daughter. And she notices some other suspicious activity going on in the house. So then they try to call social services, but then you know how the system in the United States is like very shitty, very slow. Because there's not much follow up and they don't really have proof that anything sketchy is going on, they decide to take matters in their own hands and try to investigate for themselves. The task that this book has on Goodreads says stuff like thriller, mystery, suspense. That is a goddamn lie. The book was none of those things. It was literally just any news story that you would find if you just turned on your TV. When I read more about the author and how she was inspired to write this story, she actually did read a newspaper article about this local family that had been exposed for doing some sketchy shit with a child. And I feel like knowing that added a lot of context for how this story came to be because she literally just plucked out that newspaper story and like didn't add anything to it. Like there was no twist. There was no new thing that got added. There wasn't even any social commentary that could have been added. Things worked out way too easily in this book because the system is so fucked. We could have had some great commentary going on, but we didn't. And if we didn't, at least we could have had some juice see shit going on but again we did it this is the same kind of abuse that you would see on the news so it's not really adding anything new if i wanted to see this i would literally just turn on 2020 or i would go to like a true crime channel or something i end up getting super bored while reading it i was like if this little girl does not murder this whole ass family i'm gonna fucking take a nap i've sprinkled my mac and cheese with the nacho chips and the Mexican cheese, so I'm gonna add it to the oven now. Let me try to multitask and tell you why I rate this two stars while I try not to burn myself. The reason why I rated it low is because the writing is not great. It does a lot of telling, but not any showing. So for example, a character would do a gesture and then the writing would explain what the gesture meant. So it's almost like it over explained a lot of stuff. There was no creativity or lyricism with the writing at all. It was just very straightforward and almost kind of like spelling everything out for you. The antagonist of this book is this huge narcissist, very selfish, is so delusional with her own selfishness. People like her do exist. So I don't think she necessarily had to be developed. I think my problem was that we wasted so much of the book on her perspective. Actually, the book had a lot of character perspectives that I don't think were needed. So it kind of felt like it was all over the place. If you're gonna have a perspective for this antagonist, I would expect her to be developed in some way or have some kind of layer or nuance to her. She was just depicted as the same abusive narcissistic asshole that the other characters see her as. So what is what is the point of reading her own perspective when it's going to be the same shit? I think it's better to just keep it focused to a smaller set of characters that are adding to the story. Like just keeping it to the old lady and the foster daughter that she takes in. Also speaking of those two, I really liked their relationship. I thought it was sweet. They were like a grandma and granddaughter that found comfort in each other. I would have liked for that to kind of be the focal point throughout the story and have that be consistent. But as you get wrapped up in figuring out what the tea is with the child, then the grandma character gets put in the background. I would have liked her to be more involved, but instead she kind of just fades in the background and the other young woman ends up doing like a lot of the grunt work. I question, first of all, does there need to be that many perspectives? And if the old woman does not do that much later on in the story, why were we introduced to her in the beginning of the book as if she were the main character? So I do think a lot of the writing choices in here were not properly thought out. Oh, perfect. My rant was just the right amount of time for my mac and cheese to be done. not look too bad but I feel like when you put cheese on anything it becomes easier to eat it maybe that's just an American thing like that's how easy we are to please bone apple titty okay maybe I'm just really hungry but this ain't bad like I would gladly eat the entire bowl
Mm -mm -mm. Yay, I'm glad that, you know, it ended up not turning out like crap. It sure was looking that way for a while. Thanks for watching. Go ahead and unsubscribe from my channel and goodbye. How she practices piano on her thigh Imagining the keys inside her mind Does she notice?